live in two minutes. Welcome to Lynn Cullen Live at PGHCityPaper.com. Email your questions and comments to Lynn at PGHCityPaper.com. Well, hello there and a good uh, morning. <laughs> Uh-oh, that doesn't bode well. I couldn't even think it was morning, noon, or night. Uh, good morning. What a beautiful day it is. The sun on your face at the bus stop. Is there anything more glorious? It actually made me remember what it felt like when I'd go out to visit my parents in the desert of California when they had a place out there after coming from the cold winter of the Midwest and going out in the morning and just my putting my face up to that sun. It feels so good. Are we ready for the spring or what? Yes. Hello. It's uh, Monday, February 25. And uh, we are blithely careening into sequestration. But I shall not speak of it because I, like most Americans, refuse to pay any attention to it whatsoever. It's boring. We understand we're heading into something horrific. It is a absolute uh, indication of the total dysfunction of our government. And yeah, so yawn. What else is no? It's too bad because the president had tried to get us riled up. His uh, his idea was to use his bully pulpit to rouse the American people, who like him so much, to call their representatives and senators and tell them to cut this crap out. And what did all these people who like him so much do? But, you know, listen, we thus retain our ability to be constantly outraged by the dysfunction of our government and uh, removing ourselves from uh, any culpability (laughs) at all, as if our government has nothing to do with us. When I seem to recall that the, all those people sitting in the Congress of the United States were elected by we, the people. So the Congress is of our making. The president was asking us to please remind these idiots that and that they weren't doing their job, and we have not done it. Nor will we, because we're a bunch of, I don't know, 
I don't know, what are we? We're lazy, we're spoiled, we're... And again, we want to retain the right of um, constantly carping about uh, the government and refusing to acknowledge that the government is, in fact, us! There. Now let's talk about the Oscars. <laughs> oh. I was at a meeting last night, and I raced home. Made it in the door just as the opening was happening. Great timing. And I was thinking, maybe four hours later, <laughs> what was that? What was that all about? Now I, I, I don't even know where to start. I'm thinking that there's no way to do that show. There must not be any way to do that show and make it interesting make it hold for the amount of time that they apparently think they need to uh, do the job. I don't know. I thought it was uh, generally awful, um, uninspired, not particularly funny, way too long. We'll start with the opening, which lasted. I couldn't believe it. I thought, well, can we get to the show? What is this? I didn't tune in to see this. I tuned in to see blah, blah, blah. the Oscars. What is this? So all I can say is I don't think Seth MacFarlane will be doing the show again. But then again, it's, it's, it's almost impossible, I guess, to do it. I, I don't know where to start. Where do we start? Where do we start? Oh, the clothes. The clothes were boring. There was nothing that was particularly unusual. There's nothing you could particularly make fun of. It's everybody plays it safe. Everybody looked, I guess, kind of lovely. They even had done their hair, most of them. I don't know. What? Huh? No fun. Hello, we got a call? Well, hello, Lynn. It's Michael from Palm Springs, feeling the sun on his face oh. and kind of confused about the Oscars myself. Now, I, I am an Oscar historian. I, I have followed them uh, all of my life. Uh, I have seen all of the awards and, uh, or, well, winning films. But I don't know if you know, the original broadcasts of the Oscars up until around the 40s was simply... A luncheon, a dinner banquet. Yes, I do know that. In which the nominees were read and then the awards were given all in just one sequence. Right. Yeah. And it's it's gotten to be such a media event. And, and with Michelle Obama, I love the lady. I love the lady. But giving out the Oscar, they, they totally... I agree. ...tied politics with the movies. No, I agree. I, you know, I love her, too. I and that was just one step too far. It, 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 you know, come on. Uh, you know, as some I think somebody pointed out, what if you had Michelle Obama saying, and the uh, Oscar for Best Picture goes to zero dark, uh, whatever that is, thirty. 30. Yeah, exactly. I mean, well, as soon as be... they they announced that she was giving out the award, I was like, okay, we know zero dark thirty isn't winning, <laughs> but. Yeah, what was that about? I mean, I, it it was unnecessary. It um... it's tied in with Argo in a way because Argo, the basic premise is America is in danger. Hollywood saves the day. Uh huh. Here, here. It, yep. It, yeah. No, I I I mean, you would admit that that last night's show was. Uh, <laughs> A real More snooze. boring than sequestration. Ah! Oh, my God. That's about as damning a critique as I've heard, and I've heard a bunch of them already. <laughs> wow. And they're going to look to lay blame, but the, the blame is all of the songs. Oh, and, and the biggest irk that I have with the Academy was a few years ago when they started nominating more than five pictures. Right. Yeah, exactly. What? Just utterly just to, ridiculous. Yeah, and just to make it long, longer. I don't know. It, right, it right. Was, was, and all of the best picture nominees were 
insufferably long movies. <laughs> I think the shortest one was Silver Linings Playbook, which was two hours and one minute. Hmm. Well, I just thought, in general, it was awful. Flat out. I saw your boobs. I saw your boobs. Yeah. Remember that number? Yeah, that was the first one. Yeah, crazy. I saw your and boobs. And Kristen Stewart did not appreciate that. None of the women who were shown did, but uh, there again, I mean, I'm not quite, I don't know. I, you know, that could have been funny, I guess, in the right, but, but I mean. If you know you, what, for Seth MacFarlane's audience. Exactly, young adolescent boy humor. And right. this was an effort A.O. Scott, the uh, critic for the New York Times, can't stand Seth MacFarlane. Just, you know, walks out of the room when American Dad is on, but his kids love it. Yeah, well, I don't walk out of the room when American Dad is on, and I, you know, I think Seth MacFarlane is capable of being pretty funny and definitely outrageous, and I did not realize how talented he was, that he has his great voice, that he dances, he can do everything, apparently. Oh, yes. But this was not a, this was not uh, well done at all. It was horrific. I feel sorry for him in a way because... You know, they were grasping at straws trying to figure out how to do this damn show. And I don't know. Maybe next year with uh, with uh, Amy and Tina, they will uh, do a better job. I'm sure they will, actually. Time will tell. We'll give it okay. a year. All right. See ya. All right. That's my two cents worth. Okay. Bye. Okay. Non with the clothes, yeah. which I really don't care about. No. Well, I love to look at the clothes, but it was they were boring. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I kind of thought Les Mis was going to win the Oscar for uh, costume, but it went to Anna Karenina. Yeah. Which I missed, unfortunately. Oh, no, but. don't say unfortunately. I watched it on On Demand the other day. It's awful. I can imagine. It's not my favorite Tolstoy, and I really don't like that director. No, that Kieran director Knightley is not awful. Me. The whole idea was horrific. Don't look, okay? All right. Thank you. Bye, Michael. Enjoy the sun. We've got it here, too. Chuck writes, Seth MacFarlane was a terrible host, perhaps worse than David Letterman's Oscar performance, and that's pretty bad. His violence joke about Rihanna and Chris Brown, yeah, completely inappropriate. Oh, the one that got me was the John Wilkes Booth comment. Mm. That was so cringifying. And for those of you, I, I'm not even going to repeat it. Uh, we have another caller. Go ahead, please. Hello? 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 Mm -hmm. um, Barbara Streisand, yes, she looked fantastic, and she still sounds better than just about anybody. I was looking at her thinking, wait a minute, lady, you're older than me. What? The wonders of surgery and makeup. Wow. You would think she, she could have been, uh, you know, 30. Ridiculous. So, oh, yeah, and that's another thing I want to say. Speaking of singers, and here I haven't seen anybody who has agreed with me on this. This has to do with, um, why am I blanking on her name? Da Dame, no. Dame Bassett. Bassett. Uh, 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 Jesus, I, 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 I don't know. Yeah, uh, the, you know, who sang Goldfinger. Uh, Dame Shirley Bassey. That's it. So Shirley Bassey. Now we got a <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hi, Mike in Philadelphia. How are you? Hi, Mike in Philadelphia. I am fine. Good. Hey, um, just uh, the previous caller um, stating that all the movies were over two hours. Beast of the Southern Wild is about an hour and 30 minutes. And I loved it. But it's also in tough of a long in an hour and three minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are getting... Um, hey, you, what? You know, the best thing to do with this Oscar telecast, let's, let's all be honest. I don't care about animated short films. I don't care about the short film. I don't care about sound editing. I don't care about all that stuff. Cut all the unnecessary awards. Make it about... Ten awards, maybe, yeah, and you'd cut an hour and a half off the telecast. Well, you're absolutely correct, but here's where here's where 
and why this will not happen. The problem is the Academy is made up of more than actors. It's made up of those guys. It's made up of the lighting people, the sound people, the this and that, and the da, 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 da. and the po- and it's their award ceremony. And the politics of it are that you can't, you have to. Give them their due. That will never go away. They can't get rid of it. It's and it is the reason that the uh, the entire uh, show becomes so unwieldy. Um, if they just had to think about the audience, us, and what we want, they could put on a pretty good show. I would think. Yeah, because look at the Golden Globes. The Golden Globes exactly. is only about three hours. They don't give away those awards. Exactly. And uh, n- now you know more than anything, ratings is going to drive more than anything else. And 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 if the ratings start to slip, the networks will come to them and say, "Listen, you got to start cutting categories." Well, they've already cut a whole bunch of them. They tell us, you know, earlier in the day, this one won, that one won. There's a million other awards that we don't we don't see presented. But you're right; they need to cut about half of them out again. We don't and, and care. I will, and I would say this is the first year. Of the last three years, we used to have an Oscar party in uh, when I used to live in the Netherlands, and our European friends uh, loved this. They didn't care how long it was, uh, they didn't care how long it took, they didn't care about anything. They just—I uh, think they have a longer attention span than us Americans. I think. Well, that might um, be too. Yeah. And 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 they loved it. Of course, it was from America, so they maybe thought uh, you know that it's, a, that it's special, but. Uh, uh, they didn't care how long it was. They would have sat through another hour and a half of it. They just loved seeing the movie stars. They loved the glamour. Uh, they they would uh, even the, the stupid categories. They loved all that stuff. Well, you know, we and maybe might, that's that... just us being uh, short <laughs> with a short attention span. I don't know, but I could tell you there's a big difference. Yeah. Well, that explains the one billion audience. So I mean, it is yeah. a global audience. But you, but you're also correct. What people tune in for is. The glamour to see the stars, to see the dresses, to see uh, that kind of thing, and it just gets lost in this attempt yeah, to sure. make it into a variety show, and with all this crap inserted in that they can't get rid of, um, like all those awards that we don't particularly care about. I, I don't know. Right. And, and what a lot of people are missing too, um, because I've heard you say it. I've heard about a couple of a couple three other people. Say this morning, uh, during the boob song, which I thought wasn't funny, but it was a, at least a, a, a good try. Yeah, yeah. Um, when they cut away to the actresses, those were all pre-recorded. I agree. Uh, those, were, those were all pre-recorded uh, reactions. I agree. All their dresses are different. That is correct, and good for you for seeing it. I, I at first was shocked when I saw the first cutaway. I forgot who it was because she looked so angry, and I thought, "Ah, oh, come on." Naomi Watts. And I thought, oh, come on. But then, yeah, it became obvious that, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's part of the whole shtick that these actresses agreed. Which which made me laugh a little bit because it was at least poking fun uh, of it. But, you know, the the, the Academy Awards, those people take themselves so seriously. They hate to have anything uh, poked fun at. I mean, I I thought it was great when he had the Mel Gibson line. And the whole room groaned, and he said, oh, okay, so you're all on his side? Yeah. Uh, which I thought was hilarious. He well, had some great bits. The sound of music thing fell completely flat. Um, you want to know, know what, what he was going for I'll there. tell you what fell um, the flattest. The fell, okay. the, the, what fell the flattest, I was dying, cringing for them, was the presentation by two wonderfully talented, very funny people, blanking on her name, the... Fat actress. And oh, the, uh, Melissa McCarthy and Paul Rudd? Yes. What the hell was that? Yeah, I, I don't know what that is. Those are two uh, Very immensely talented, funny people. And it was... Um, I, I don't know who wrote that for them. Oh or they wrote God. themselves, but it was, it was a swing and a big mess. So even they, incredibly talented, couldn't pull that off. I, I felt so sorry for them. Also, all those uh, Avenger guys, what was that? Was that supposed to be the messed up thing it was, or was it supposed to be... Yeah, they seem so mad at each other. And, you know, here's another thing. What? Don't, don't, bring out, don't bring out four of the six Avengers. If you can't bring them all out, because Scarlett Johansson was missing and the guy who plays Thor was missing. 
if you can't bring them all out, then don't bring them all out. Okay? Don't bring them. Don't say, here's four of the six people who are in the Avengers, uh, which I thought was ridiculous. Um, you know, I mean, if you're going to have them all, then have them all. Or just have Robert Downey Jr. and Samuel Jackson. Don't, because the more people you have, the more, the more you realize that they're not all there, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and also, the James Bond tribute, I was real, I'm a huge James Bond fan. Oh, and I was, was so awful. looking forward to that, and it completely fell flat, I think. It was awful. Um, the rumor was that they were all going to be there. Everybody who ever played James Bond was going to be there. I, I don't know what happened there. Um, and, and again, I, I, I would probably give them credit if they said they could only get three of the seven people who played them. But, but uh, you know, it, just to show a montage of James Bond and then to bring her out seeing Goldfinger, which, you know, of course, the people who are in the James Bond today, I'm, I'm, I'm a James Bond historian, so... Uh, I, I I can appreciate that, but people who were in the James Bond today, who are in the 20s and 30s, have no idea who she is or what that song even was, um, and, and and wouldn't be able to appreciate it. What they should have done was a montage of. I mean, it was about all these James Bond songs, and then they had one person sing one James Bond song. Have a couple people sing. Have a montage of three or four or five or six different uh, James Bond okay. songs. Okay. All right. Hey, and thank and you. I would have much rather seen. Uh, I mean, you're 50 years of James Bond, you're a two-minute piece on it. I thought it was a little bit ridiculous. All right. Well, thank you for that critique. Heartfelt and and who knew you were a historian? We have had two historians call. Who knew? <laughs> thank and you. Let's get your spot out to Philadelphia for a tour of mine this, this summer. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, 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 sir. Excuse me. Yes, sir. Will do. And um, I will talk to you later. Okay, bye. Uh, here's what I was going to say, and Dame Shirley Bassey, the Goldfinger singer. I'm the only one, I, I haven't heard anybody say this, I'm about to say it. She got the, a big standing ovation. Everyone today that I read say she brought down the house, what a bravura performance, this and that. Um, excuse me? The first note out of her mouth was flat, was flat as a pancake. The first note she sang was like not right. I can't sing, but I got a good ear, I know. And I cringed. I thought, oh, my God. And it was followed by a bunch of other notes that didn't quite make the grade. And then her voice was like tremulously trying to hang on a few times. Now, I understand, she's 76 years old. Um, but I thought it was awful. She got better as the song went on, no doubt about it. But people acting as if that was some extraordinary performance. Forget about it. No, it wasn't. It was another miss, if you ask me. Uh, Dorothea writes, she felt sorry for Jennifer Lawrence tripping on the steps. But I have to tell you, it led to one of the, I thought, best moments because she handled it so well. Um, I'm sorry. What is she, 22, 20, 22 years old? Uh, falls flat on her face at the in, you know in front of a billion people, and she she, I mean this couldn't have been scripted. She gets up and she says, "Ah, you guys are just standing up because you feel bad that I fell," <laughs> and that's really embarrassing. But thanks. Okay, that's cool. That's a cool cucumber because she let it go. She you know, and then she she was um, I thought impressive as as heck. I did, and I know Jess is cringing because Jess can't stand her. I love her. Oh, I thought you hated her. No, I just didn't want her to win. I oh, didn't you didn't want her to win. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, she won, as everyone knew she would. Um, okay, well, we can get back in. You know, part of the thing about the Oscars, too, and let's acknowledge this and be honest. We look forward not only to the Oscars, but we look forward the next day at ripping them apart, right? That's, I think, more a national pastime than actually watching them. It's the next day ripping apart the production numbers, the clothes, the hair, what people said, what people didn't say. Who the, I think that's more the allure 
for we the people than the show itself. And so we are, are um, uh, truly engaged in, in doing uh, just that. I have a few more little critiques and thoughts, but I want to take a break. And if any of you want to throw some more stuff in, you do that, okay? But after this. Email your questions and comments to lynn at pghcitypaper.com or call Lynn at 412-316-3381. Lynn Cullen Live will return in a moment. Go to BergBargains.com for great deals on meals from your favorite local restaurants, museums, and shows. This week only, get discounts up to 20% on gift cards to P.F. Chang's. Supplies are limited. BergBargains.com, Pittsburgh's best bargains. BergBargains.com. I didn't know about chronic obstructive pulmonary disease until I took the wheel and lent my support to Drive for COPD. Help Americans take action against this leading cause of death by logging on to driveforcopd.org to learn more. I'm Nancy Cartwright, the voice of Bart Simpson, and I drive for COPD. Have a question or an opinion? Call Lynn Cullen at 412-316-3381 or email lynn at pghcitypaper.com. Now, more with Lynn Cullen Live. Uh, one of the things I must say that I liked um, in that overlong um, intro that went on for almost a half hour before you even got to the awards, I liked them showcasing the fact that these actors that we see, men and women, are extremely multi-talented. So that you saw, I love that you saw actors and actresses that you don't normally see dancing. I loved that they danced. I loved, you know, and they didn't, they weren't great. But it was sort of, you know, the soft shoes and the the waltzing and whatever that... Um, Charlize Theron. So it, it was very nice to. I thought it was sweet, and um, and I I also liked the fact that you could tell they were like really nervous. It looked like a dance recital. I you know like you, know, you could see them almost counting under their breath. It was there was something sweet about that to me. Um, what else? What else? Uh, <laughs> The Lincoln joke I could not get over. Um, and he obviously wrote it knowing people would gasp. And so he had the follow-up joke ready, which was 150 years and it's still too soon. And the answer to that, Mr. Adolescent Humor, is yes, it's still too soon and it will be too soon till the end of time okay i get for those of you who didn't didn't hear it i guess i should do this uh, I guess he was talking about the fact that uh, Daniel Day Lewis, you know, really gets into the characters he plays, so he sort of becomes Lincoln, and um, and how he was not the first uh, actor to win an award for playing Lincoln. Raymond Massey also won a million years ago. Raymond Massey, by the way, was held up uh, by my acting teacher. Uh, the the great, although frightening, uh, Sanford Meisner as being the absolute worst actor that he had ever seen. And Sanford Meisner would tell his students always, if you want to know how you don't act, watch Raymond Massey. He cannot act. But he got an Oscar. Ain't that nice? Uh, the joke about Lincoln was this. The actor who really got inside Lincoln's head was John Wilkes Booth. And no one laughed. In a room of 3,000 people, no one laughed. Which shows that as much as we have, you know, lost our way <laughs> in, uh, in this culture, we haven't gone that far. Uh... Just horrific. Horrific. Uh, yike. 
And what else? What else? What else? Um, my, oh, hang on. Richard writes, Catherine Zeta-Jones was lip syncing her Chicago, absolutely, and not very well. Um, although I suspect she was lip syncing it because she had to dance so much. You know, it'd be pretty hard to be holding some of the notes she was holding while she was literally being held upside down with her leg in the air. I mean, it, it's hard to do. So I understood the lip syncing of that. I thought there was some other lip syncing that didn't look too right. Um, the Les Mis cast, I don't think that was lip synced, as and neither does Richard. I, I do that seemed live. Uh, Jennifer Hudson seemed live. Adele seemed live. Barbara Streisand seemed live. But uh, yeah, Catherine Zeta Jones did did not. And what was that about the orchestra? He said something about, and, of course, the orchestra. And I looked, like, you know, down on the, where the orchestra usually is, but, of course, the orchestra wasn't there. And then they showed a picture of an orchestra in another building somewhere, and that was the orchestra that was playing for the Academy Awards, and it wasn't even in the room? Yeah. Well, did I misunderstand that? Somebody help me with that. No, I was so mixed up. Okay, and Nate Silver, the uh, political prognosticator uh, who, uh, you know, just nailed the political winners and losers in the, in the last election, uh, took a shot at the major awards. And he didn't do badly, but he got two wrong, and they're the two wrong that a lot of people would have. Nobody thought Ang Lee was going to win Best Director. And I have to say, I didn't see Life of Pi. I guess I better see it now. It won so many awards. So that was a shocker. He thought Spielberg would get it, and I think Spielberg thought Spielberg would get it. And the other one he missed, and I would have missed too, was uh, Best Supporting Actor, uh, which I thought was a slam dunk for Tommy Lee Jones, uh, but he didn't get it, and it went to uh, a great actor, this Austrian actor, uh, Walls, for uh, Django Unchained. He was, he was just an incredible actor. Incredible actor. Uh, oh, the in memoriam thing. Now, we were talking about how the Oscars are too long because they do cinematography, makeup, costumes, yada, yada, yeah, who cares, shorts, longs, features, animated this is and that's, adapted this is and blah, blah, blah. And most people don't give a damn. But in memoriam used to be, I used to enjoy it because they would show you the people who had died in the last year, but they were stars. So you'd see all these stars, and sometimes they'd show them actually acting. And some of those things, those montages that were put together in the past were really wonderful and memorable. And this year, just about the only actor in it was Ernest Borgnine, who they started with. I'm trying to think of who else. Celeste Holm. What other actors were even in there? Everybody else you'd never even heard of. Who were these people? I mean, they even had press agents. And, 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 and it, was, it was people that nobody knew. Now, I understand, because I read something once, that the lobbying to get into the in memoriam thing is almost as intense as the lobbying for Best Picture and um, uh, some of the other awards. Because a lot of people die <laughs> and there's not room to put them all in. But again, if you're putting on a TV show, I'll tell you what the audience wants. They want people they recognize. They don't want these members of the Academy. All those old white men that we've never seen in our lives. 
We might recognize a director, but we ain't going to recognize, you know, the greatest gaffer in the world or, uh, you know, this one who and, – and, you know, maybe we should, but you can't have a great show – if you're going to still be this little group wanting to pay homage to its own. We understand there's like 5,000 people who belong to this academy. They should do their own little show then and pay proper homage to their own, but then have a show for the people. And all the people care about are the stars. Uh, oh, somebody knows something. Michael knows about the orchestra. What was that? It is my understanding the orchestra is under the stage. So they were in a room under the stage and they were connected uh, via CCTV. So they've been kicked off the the floor, and put in the basement. But here's the odd thing about it. If they're under the stage, how does the sound? I mean, that, that impacts how the sound gets out. Ugh. I don't get it. Uh, Michael also says about the Tech Awards, being the Academy of Arts and Sciences... The purpose of the ceremony is to showcase the collaborative efforts, this is true, which go into the making of movies. Sound, editing, writing, cinematography are all vital elements. I've always thought doing away with performances of best song would be a good start for shortening the show. I agree with that, absolutely. And you are absolutely correct that there is an effort to educate the movie going public by telling us you know these things don't just happen you need somebody who is a wizard at sound editing you need someone who's a wizard at you know whatever lighting um and now uh special effects and visual effects and yeah blah, 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 blah. i understand but it just doesn't make a good show I mean, maybe there's some way to make it make a good show, but clearly they haven't figured it out. Haven't figured it out. Okay, I don't think I've got anything left to say. Anybody else on the Oscars? Because uh, after uh, this, we will move on to other topics. Um, and you will not be allowed to complain about uh, the Oscars until next year. Hmm? So, what I hate about it is you get so excited about it. You know, oh, I can't wait. Oh, I can't wait. You run out and see every movie you can. You did it in. You sit down and you're, and then you get jerked around and bored out of your mind. And it, it was, I just thought, awful. And gone are the days of the uh, over-the-top divas who used to show up. Remember Cher and what she would wear? Remember, I mean, people having some fun, showing some personality. And now everybody, I guess, and I understand, is so fearful of being, you know, ridiculed and made a laughing stock by the incredible hordes of uh, people uh, on television, on uh, radio, in, uh, on the internet, who make their living ripping people apart and ridiculing them. So I guess people just are trying to avoid being a laughing stock, and I guess you can't blame them for that. By the way, one of our favorite publications, The Onion, did something so horrific last night in a tweet that I don't know that I'll ever be able to enjoy another word that they say. And I can't even repeat it. They had a tweet about, and I can't pronounce her name, the, the adorable nine-year-old actress. 
and they called her a word that I can't even say. They called her a word I won't even say. And you know I say lots of words. I cannot say this word. It's a pejorative, ugly term. And they thought they were being funny. So there's something about this, and it's adolescent male humor that, that now affects, infects so much of our culture. Seth MacFarlane's joke about Lincoln's assassination and this attempted humor with this lovely child. It's amazing. Just flat out amazing. Okay, I'm going to take another little break and we'll come back and actually do the kind of serious reportage that this program, of course, has won many awards for. Don't ask me which or when or any of that. We'll be back. Stick around for more with Lynn Cullen Live after this. Pittsburgh City Paper's annual money issue is available now. Pick up one today for a unique look at financial issues in the region. Plus, this week's City Paper includes our inaugural education pullout, Decisions for the Future. Pittsburgh City Paper, available at over 1,700 locations throughout western Pennsylvania. And on the web at pghcitypaper.com. And on your smartphone at citypapermobile.com. Packers. Vikings. We come from different places. Uptown. Downtown. We come to different conclusions. Half empty. Half full. But when we live united, we make a real difference in the building blocks of life. Children succeed in school. Families gain financial stability. The health of our neighbors improves, and suddenly so do our communities. Real change won't happen without you. Live Live United. United. So give, advocate, volunteer. Live United. Sign up today at liveunited.org. Brought to you by United Way and the Ad Council. You're listening to Lynn Cullen Live at pghcitypaper.com. Once again, here's Lynn Cullen. Okay. um, Oh, thanks, Ansel. Um, Ansel uh, writes that uh, some of the actors who did die last year, who should have been in that montage that we might have recognized, and it is amazing. Oh, Charles Durning was. I see on the list you have Charles Durning and Jack Klugman. Both of them were. Both of them were. Charles Durning and Jack Klugman. But listen to some of them that weren't. Larry Hagman, Whitney Houston. Now, I'll tell you, in this regard... They, though, neither of those actors, uh, Whitney Houston and Larry Hagman, are not known for their movies, really. I mean, Houston did make movies, but Andy Griffith. Now, he deserves to be there because he, believe it or not, was a great actor. You might not know it, but a great actor. Ben Gazzara, a great actor. Alex Karras, a great football player <laughs> and a bit of an actor. James Ferentino, I'm sure there's more. And they were shunted aside for a lot of people who, I guess, you know, listen. The Motion Picture uh, Arts and Sciences, whatever the hell it is, Academy, is we have to remember this little um, very select group. And only about a fifth of the membership of the Academy are people we would recognize. All these other people are, you know, the people who put movies together who we don't know. Um, man, I thought the biggest disappointment of the weekend was that there was no more news on the uh, cop scandal. I kept, you know, we were getting so used to every day the <laughs> another shoe was dropping. And I was likening it to, I said, this is better than Downton Abbey. 
You know, I doubt Abbey you had to wait a week before you get another installment. This one, we were getting 24-hour installments. I loved it. Loved it. But then over the weekend, totally dried up. So I'm left with just this that was in Saturday's paper, and I two little items I want to pass on to you. This, it says here that the mayor says he had no plans of employing a consultant or a search committee to recruit candidates for the next police chief. I find that incredible. I've been on search committees for, believe me, much lesser uh, agencies and uh, agencies of import than a police department of a major city. You have a police department that appears perhaps to be rife with corruption. You have heads rolling, suspensions here, you've got FBI, you've got... You've got boxes being taken out. You've got a grand jury sitting. You've got something very interesting going on. And the chief of police has been canned or forced to resign. And the mayor says he's not going to have a search committee or a consultant the mayor says he wants somebody who has no ties to the police department, someone who will come in from the outside and not be part of whatever whatever smelly, stinky, ossified, good old boy network exists here in the police department that leads to the kind of corruption that we're seeing uncovered. But to, so does Luke Ravenstahl personally know a bunch of police chiefs all over the country? How does he, you find out who the great candidates are by using somebody whose job it is to know. That would be a consultant or it would be a search committee made up of people who will go out and find the best candidates for Ravenstall not to employ either a consultant or a search committee in this regard when he says he wants somebody that he doesn't know, that somebody out there that'll come in with a fresh view and clean house. Well, and he's appointed himself. Well, that's insane. It's flat out stupid. And then he says he would consult with the rank and file. And the fraternal order of police. Before he made a selection. Wait a minute. Why would you talk to the rank and file if you want somebody totally from the outside who's going to come in? It doesn't matter what they think. Seriously. I'm just... Okay, and here's the other thing I saw on Saturday. As you know, we have an acting chief of police, and that is one, um, I'm for blanking on her first name, McDonald. Why am I blanking on her first name? Christina? Regina? 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 I think so. Okay. I'll take that. <laughs> she, there's so many new names in these stories now, and I, don't, I, I haven't gotten them through my head yet. Okay, so it says that on message boards uh, uh, for the FOP, the police union, there have been a lot of questions raised about why McDonald would be allowed, listen to this, why she would be appointed when it says here, here are the whispers, get this, that she has a nearly 30-year relationship with a man 
who was convicted in 1975 of extortion and perjury. (sighs) Okay, so this is true. She's not married to him, but apparently they're an item. Probably, Probably be called common law husband and wife. What is it with the cops that either they seem to be committing crimes or they're bedding down with criminals? What is this? City policy states, get this, no member of the police, of the, uh, no member, I don't know if it's of the police department or in the city, no member shall knowingly commence or maintain a relationship with any person who has an open and notorious criminal reputation in the community. Well, I don't know if this guy she's with is, could be considered notorious or, uh, his name is Max Homer. He's a, (laughs) what he is, he's just another run of the mill corrupted state legislator. Before my time, Max Homer, a former state representative, he served his time. He uh, extortion, perjury. He demanded uh, money from two businessmen to help secure a building permit. So he shook down in his capacity as um, a legislator. He shook down two guys um, to help them. Now that just sounds like that's great. So this is our, our, our now acting police chief, has a 30-year relationship with a guy who violated the public trust. Oh, yes, he served his time, but <laughs> what? Jesus, what is this? I'm beginning to think I'm the only person in town with clean hands. What is with these people? <clears throat> and this is our new police chief. <clears throat> She wants to hunt down criminals. She just has to roll over in bed. (laughs) Jesus, God. All right. Chris writes, totally agree with you on Seth MacFarlane. I never, you know, I have to, okay. I never liked him. Like Doug used to say, not funny. I nominate him for the worst host ever. Well, are you forgetting James Franco and Anne Hathaway? That was cringifying. That was not one minute was it not horrific. Um, If he thinks that that's humor, give me a break. I'm not some old fuddy-duddy either. This just sums him up. In his movie Ted, he had a line in there where that stupid bear says to Mark Wahlberg, I hope you get Lou Gehrig's disease. Oh, that's a laugh. I never saw the stupid movie. I did. This was on the local news. Really? That's funny? Maybe it hits home to me because I just lost a very dear friend to Lou Gehrig's disease at the age of 53. I think his humor appeals to 14 to 18-year-old boys. And how many of those are watching the Oscars? Well, I got news for you, Chris. Um, His humor, (laughs) uh, your age range is too low. His humor appeals to 14 to... 50-year-old boys and girls. And girls. (laughs) And this is what is considered humor now. It's gross. It's often misogynistic. It's, this is it. I mean, all you have to do is go to the movies now. (laughs) And that's what it is. Uh, okay, uh, and Michael writes, the Onion tweet regarding, how do you pronounce her name? Quivangene? Quivangene. Quivangene. Jeez, why can't you name somebody Mary like they used to? The Onion tweet regarding the little, sweet little actress was fully lacking in context and was not funny. And regarding the Lincoln joke, 
that was contextual and in bad taste. This is where we agree. I disagree with you that it lacks humor. There is a style of comedy which benefits from shock value. When something shocking is said, we gasp. And if the context is there, it invokes laughter, which dumps endorphins into the system, hence making the joke make us feel better. I don't think that Lincoln joke did that. It's horrific. I can't bear to think of Lincoln being assassinated. I, I can't bear, you know, when I saw the movie, I, you know, talk about magical thinking. I, I wanted him to live. <laughs> you know, I knew I was going to come out, but I said, oh, please. No, no. It will never be funny, ever. And I think there's something about this kind, the fact that some things should be off limits that I guess, again, just like in many ways, the kind of things that we always thought we agreed upon in terms of civility, that's gone by the boards in large part. And I don't think there's a lot of people, even smart people, talented people like Seth MacFarlane, who have trouble discerning where the lines should be drawn. They uh, seemingly, uh, you know, if you're, if you're in the business that he's in, you're supposed to know the lines. Now, maybe he screwed up because he had a different audience than he usually has. He had an audience made up of Everybody, older people, younger people, Americans and foreign people and all of this. And something in his head, some censoring mechanism should have said to himself, tread a little more carefully, Seth, than you do when you're writing Family Guy. Because this is a new audience and it's not as young and it's not as immature, and it's not as forgiving, I guess. Okay, so uh, there's a lot of Vatican papal stuff going on. And uh, as you know, there was, I'm assuming you know, uh, one of Italy's leading newspapers came out with a pretty shocking report. And this is not a National Enquirer kind of a newspaper. This is La Repubblica, which is, I think, the biggest newspaper in um, Italy. And it, it came out with a report about sort of a, a gay cabal in the Vatican, that there is a group of cardinals and who knows what that are gay, and they sort of are together and priests, but they're inside the Vatican, and that they have sex parties here and there and are known and blah, 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 but that there's something about um, potential bribery and things going on with them and to them and from them and I don't know it's just sort of like it looks like really stunning kind of stuff and this article was suggesting that maybe the Pope uh, is getting the hell out of Dodge because this thing's about to and he doesn't want to be around he's I, he doesn't have the energy to deal with it plus the Vatican Bank plus all this other stuff. Meanwhile, what happens today? The, uh, the, car, the, the chief cardinal, I guess, in the UK, I think he resigned. And he resigned also because he's now been accused of uh, inappropriate um, uh, contact with a number of priests under him sexually harassing them and other things. And what's fascinating about this particular cardinal is this particular cardinal is known to be 
the most stridently anti-gay cardinal. I think the church has a big, big problem. <laughs> and it's sexual. And it's so obvious. And I don't know how it comes to terms with it, how it comes to terms with the reality that a large percentage of its priests are gay. At the same time that the church preaches <laughs> that being gay, oh no, I'm sorry, not being gay, but actually expressing your sexuality if you're gay is a sin. A church that is at this level of denial and let's just call it what it is, total hypocrisy, uh, is in trouble. And things don't get swept under the rug as much as they used to, you might have noticed. And with the child abuse and with now gay cabals in the Vatican, which I'm sure we're always there, but now everything's sort of like leaking, things are coming out. Uh, I don't know how the, how does the church move on? Whoever this next pope's going to be, God help him. Hmm? God help him. Because you've got a mess that makes the mess down on Grant Street look like pfft, nothing. I mean, you've got a mess that goes, that's a global mess that has to do with, as I said, deception, hypocrisy, so many sins you can't even, you can't get your hands around them, your head around it. So this will uh, bear watching. And the, the fascinating thing that this seemingly homophobic church <laughs> is a haven for homosexuals. Why would it not be? If it's men you love, well, why the hell wouldn't you want to be in an organization like that where there's nothing but men and they get to wear dresses and pretty jewelry? Well, and have little boys at their beck and call. What kind? I mean, of course. I'm sorry, church. Get your act together. Choose one or the other. You can be homophobic, but then get rid of the gays in your church. Do it and see what's left standing. Or embrace them and stop this hypocrisy. It just doesn't, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't wash. And I'm sorry if I've given offense to Catholics, but Catholics have to know it. There are openly gay priests in this city, openly gay. I know. And it doesn't even bring up how somebody who is gay, who is a priest, manages to somehow then carry water for this homophobic faith. Makes the log cabin Republicans look like they got their heads screwed on right. All right, I'm done offending people. I am finished. I am going out into this lovely February day and let the sun shine on my face. You have a great day yourselves, and uh, I'm coming back tomorrow. Hope you do, too.
Lynn Cullen Live, Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. and archived at pghcitypaper.com. The opinions expressed on Lynn Cullen Live are those of the host and do not necessarily reflect the viewpoints of Pittsburgh City Paper, Steel City Media, and its advertisers.